Today on Outside the Box Reviews, we're taking a look at the NECA Universal Monsters, the Phantom of the Opera figure. I'm going to apologize at the top of this review. I've been a bit under the weather the last few days. I really do want to get this review shot and put out, but if my voice sounds a little off throughout this, that's my excuse. But yeah, after finishing the Bride of Frankenstein review, I mentioned that I did need to re-watch this movie to kind of feel like I could do a better job reviewing this figure, and I'm really glad I did, because I also looked back at a couple of my older Phantom of the Opera figure reviews of the Diamond Select ones, and realized that I got a couple things wrong in those ones, because they're fairly old reviews at this point, but I realized that I messed up a couple bits in those on what things were and what they were for with those figures, that rewatching the movie really did help clarify. And I believe this figure marks the first silent era movie monster we've gotten from NECA. I know there are a couple others on the list, including Nosferatu and London After Midnight, but I do think it's a little weird they went with Phantom this early on, well maybe not so weird because it is an iconic movie monster, an iconic movie monster look. But seeing that another Lon Chaney silent era horror film for Universal, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, turns 100 years old this year, it seems like that might have been the more obvious choice to go with, just to tie it into an anniversary or whatever. But not complaining, excited to get this figure, so let's go ahead and take a closer look at him. The Phantom does come with a nice array of hands here, both for his right and left hand. We get a kind of open grasping hand. We also get matching kind of what I would call gesturing hands. So the fingers are kind of in different poses on those hands. And then for his left, we get kind of a loose grasping hand. And then for his right, we get a cane holding hand, similar to what we got with the Dracula figure. Flip those around to kind of give you a better view of them. The detailing isn't very different than any other standard human hand we've gotten in this line. I wouldn't be surprised. Actually, I put in Dracula's hand there on the left, and it looks like it may almost be the same sculpt, if not the same sculpt. Seems like the fingers may be a little different in their heights, but very, very similar. Nothing kind of to distinguish it. The color is a little grayer, which makes sense with the character. But yeah, they're not particularly deformed or anything like that, which I believe is true to the character. The diamond one had some really gnarly looking hands, and at the time I felt like that matched the character, but I think this is actually more true to how Lon Chaney's makeup actually was. And then just to flip those all over and give you a look at the underside, you know, nicely detailed with all these good wrinkles and everything going on there. And I do like that they've given us a very large selection of hands. Granted, I think this is pretty much normal for Universal Monsters, except for the Bride that we talked about having slightly fewer hand options than others. The only real accessory we get with this figure is, well, I called it a cane earlier with the hand, because it is basically the same hand that Dracula uses to hold his cane, but this really is the underwater breathing tube the snorkel. I believe in one of my previous reviews I had called it a cane because it looks like a cane, but in the movie this is something that he uses to go through the sewers of the Paris Opera House and be able to breathe and sneak up on people coming to get him in their boats. Detail on here is really nice. It almost looks like it's made from like a bamboo or something. It's kind of a grayish green color, maybe a little bit of brown in there. There are little kind of knots going throughout it, which makes me think bamboo because there are kind of like segmented areas of it. There is a goldish ring there at the very far end and then the black hook in it, which is where it would actually go into his mouth while he's trying to breathe underwater. And just sort of visual there. It's kind of difficult to get it super close to his mouth the way you would have had it in the film, but this is close enough. Um, you can get a little closer if you want to, but I'm not going to spend forever trying to get it just perfect for this quick shot. But yeah, that's basically how you would hold it going through the water. The last accessory is his cape. It's really nicely done. It kind of has a velvety exterior to it where you can see that kind of reflection of the light. The inside is a little more matte. There is a wire running through the front part of the cape here on either side. Nothing going on here in the back. It also has a plastic collar to it with a string going around his neck. So the collar is rigid and the rest of the cape is relatively flexible. Because it has that string, you kind of have to remove the head to get it on him. And then it will kind of just slip over his neck and then you can pop whichever head back onto the figure. And because it has the wire, of course, you can move and pose it however you want. You can get more dramatic looks out of it if you want to pull it around him, all that fun stuff. I think it looks really good. I love the texturized, velvety color they gave to the outside of it. I think that really enhances the look of the figure itself. It looks like some 
despite the fact that it's picked up every bit of dust and gunk that was on my table. But I think it really helps add to the look of the figure, making it look like it is something a little more substantial than just a thin piece of cloth like we've got on some of the other figures. And uh, I really like how it came out. When we get to the comparisons, I'll compare this cape to some of the other capes you've got in the past and uh, talk about how it stacks up there. For head sculpts, we actually get five different options, which I think is the most we've ever gotten on one of these Universal Monsters figures, and I dare say maybe some of the most we've ever gotten on any NECA figure ever. So I'm going to start off with the one we were just looking at with my last couple examples there. This is kind of a more standard face, kind of a worried looking face that he has. We have his kind of gross phantom teeth. I believe they said that when Lon Chaney put in these dentures, he was not able to ever close his mouth, so his mouth is like permanently open. They capture that really cool skeletal nose effect that he had going on. Like with the hands, they have this kind of grayish pale skin tone like he's been underground for years and years and years. There's a lot of darkness around his eyes. Another thing that Lon Chaney did with his makeup was to put a lot of paint around his eyes to make them look darkened and sunken in and all that. Same with around his cheekbones and everything. He has the kind of elevated skull cap on top of his head, bringing his forehead up even higher than a normal human's with the kind of slicked back hair, slicked down hair going on. Turn around to the side, you can see more of that hair going on, and then the tighter hair to the side of his face. He also has his ears really close into the side of his head, which was another bit of this makeup process. He actually like glued his ears down to his own skull. Bring around to the back, we can see the continuation of that bald spot going all the way back there with the hair detail continuing underneath it. And then a great profile view, you can see how far back that nose is pulled. I think they did a great job bringing this makeup to life in this scale. Now, if you know my reviews, you know my one gripe with this head sculpt would probably be that with this one, his eyes are looking off to his left. I honestly, with most action figures, prefer heads where the eyes are straight on just because you can move the neck and I feel like when the eyes are permanently set off to the side it makes getting some poses really awkward. However our second head has a very similar facial expression with the eyes facing dead forward. It is a little different. It's a little less worried looking perhaps. It's a little more of a neutral face. The mouth is a little bit more shut but still keeping in all those iconic details of this makeup. And then we can take a look at it from this side, from the back, and from the other side. Next up is another kind of classic phantom facial expression, this being his ghastly grin. This is another one where the eyes are slightly off to the side, but not as extreme as that first head we looked at. So I really think you could get away with a lot more going on with this face. I'm definitely happy they included this. Rewatching the movie, you know, the iconic face is one we'll get to in a minute, but you know, there are some like great scenes of him just being just devilish and laughing at people around him and almost reveling in how grotesque his face is to other people. So I think it's really cool that they included this just demonic smile look for him. We'll take a look at that from the side, from the back, and from the other side as well. One thing I neglected to mention with the hands is that one of the gesturing hands does kind of have the extended index finger that you use to reproduce the scene where you kind of see him laughing after he's been unmasked and kind of pointing and laughing. So I think it is worth noting that you can replicate that with the pieces they've given us here. And then, of course, this is what I would consider the iconic phantom facial expression. Essentially, the mask removal scene. When he's at his organ, the thing I tried to reproduce in the beginning of this video. I feel like 90% of the time, if you see the phantom, it's going to be this facial expression. And then, once again, we'll look at it from the side, from the back, and from the other side. And then last but not least, we have the masked version of the phantom. I've talked about this in other phantom reviews, but I think that the... 1925 version of the mask is one of the least iconic Phantom of the Opera masks just because honestly like the Andrew Lloyd Webber version really became what people I think see in their mind's eye when you talk Phantom of the Opera masks. But I really love the design of the 1920s version. I will say NECA made some choices here that I like, but I don't know if they're entirely accurate to what would have been on set, particularly in the fact that the mask is actually done in a flesh tone, and I believe it was documented that Lon Chaney's mask was actually painted white, and then had kind of some makeup or whatever on top of it. I like this idea that it is meant to look more like an actual human face. I don't know if it's ever something that was officially stated about the movie or the design of the stuff for the movie, but I've seen people draw comparisons 
comparisons to the Phantom's Mask, to prosthetics used by soldiers coming back from World War One, to kind of hide war injuries, facial deformities that they got from either bombings or gas or whatever during World War One. And honestly, this isn't too far off from what a lot of those looked like, just being like ceramic pieces that were painted up as best they could to match the person's face they were going on. And, you know, given the time this movie came out, that definitely would have been kind of a real world horror to draw upon. So I like this interpretation of it, even if I think technically it's supposed to be a white mask. But they really did a great job painting on all the details there and they kind of like blush to the cheeks and everything. I love that they captured that little piece of gauze going over his mouth as actual translucent plastic and you could see his phantom teeth behind it, which is great. I don't think you could ever really clearly see that in the movie, but knowing that that's what it's supposed to be, I think they knocked it out of the park with that. I will also point out, I did not count the hat as an accessory because I feel like it goes part and parcel with this head sculpt but after we do a spin of this i will take the hat off and we will take a closer look nothing too special about the hat just kind of a standard fedora it's a little bigger than like a freddy hat or something but that same kind of idea so there it is from one side the back and from the other side you can see they even included the hole in the mask where the string would go and if we take the hat off there's not much there besides the little skull cap and now i'm seeing that it looks like the hat has left residue on his face which is not good so that's a problem but yeah he has a little black skull cap going on there and you can see what i mentioned there he's got that residue that really sucks granted like i said i probably will keep the hat on this head sculpt all the time but it's a bit of a bummer and you can see the back of the head and then the other side of the head for the rest of the body, the Phantom is in his traditional tuxedo. So we have the jacket coming around the top, the big black bow tie, the white undershirt, similar to the bride. His upper and lower torso are both a rubbery plastic. You see there's lots of great wrinkle detail. Not a whole lot of color going on. It is literally just black and white clothing, but they did a lot of work adding in like little buttons throughout and wrinkles and all that good stuff. We spin around to the back, it's a little tighter across his back, but we do get wrinkles kind of near the armpits. And then we get the buttons and everything heading down to the tails of the tuxedo. And you can see that kind of tails off at about his mid calf going into the back of the pants and then same deal on the front. I will say, I think it's really just the design of the costume, but it does make the quote unquote diaper part of this figure look a little gigantic. It is kind of like ballooning, but I do think that is accurate to how the costume really did look. We got some like pleats going down the pants, some wrinkles near the knees, and then he has some nice black shiny shoes. I like that they are a nice glossy black to kind of contrast with the rest of his more matte black costume. And he does have peg holes at the bottom of either foot. For articulation, it looks like they are moving more back to what they normally do with their figures. We're just getting the one ball joint at the base of the head, as opposed to getting the double ball ball joint that we've gotten on some of the earlier Universal Monsters. I'm not too bummed out about this. I think we still get a good range. Obviously, we can go side to side. We can pivot. He looks a decent amount up and he'll look a decent amount down. The arms will rotate a full 360. They will go out to the side. They tuck pretty far into his side as well. We have a single jointed elbow, which will go past 90 degrees. It will also rotate. His hands will rotate and then hinge up and down. I believe every single hand has that same hinge direction, so they all would do the same thing. Mid-torso joint, we can rotate, we can pivot side to side. We can bend a little bit back, not too much, both hindered by the sculpt and those tails on the back of his coat. And we can go a little bit down, once again, relatively hindered just because of the costume design. At the legs, we can go forward a fair bit. Can't go back all that much. Legs will go out to the side. We can rotate at the upper leg. Single joint at the knee that bends just shy of 90 degrees. We can also rotate there. And then the feet will hinge down, they'll hinge up, and they will pivot. For a comparison, I'll bring in two other versions of the Phantom. On the left here is the Sideshow Collectibles 8-inch version, which you can see is quite a bit taller than either of these other two. And then on the right is the Universal Select Diamond Select version. So I have them all here in their masked forms. I could not find the hat for the diamond one. I think I accidentally put it with a Freddy figure. But they're all in their masks and all with their cloaks. Looking at this comparatively, I could definitely say the diamond cloak is the worst. 
first, just because it is this big, heavy rubber piece. The Sideshow one's not bad, honestly, but I think this NECA one really is the best. It also is interesting to look at the Sideshow and NECA one being both that they used a flesh tone for the mask, whereas the Diamond did what I kind of talked about, what I read for the movie, was that it's more of a white mask, like a white porcelain mask with some makeup on it. Should also be noted that both the Sideshow and the Diamond one used kind of a white strip for the bit of cloth going over the mouth, whereas NECA has that clear version, which I think is really cool. And then here they are with their phantom faces. Should be noted as well that the Diamond figure is a completely separate figure. They did two different releases. They did a deluxe release of this figure and a Toys R Us exclusive, kind of more standard release of this figure. I want to say that deluxe version was the one that came with the mask, but I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, here they all are together. And once again, I think the NECA one is the strongest of the three here. I mean, obviously these figures are considerably older. I think the Diamond stuff's like at least 10 years old and Sideshow even older. I mean, you see the Sideshow's in such rough shape. He's only got one and a half arms going on right now. But it's very cool to see the evolution of this character in figure form at roughly this scale. Obviously, they're all kind of a little all over the place with scale, but you know what I'm going for here. And then I'll bring in my standard Doc Brown size comparison and then reunite father and son with a Wolfman comparison with Lon Chaney Jr. Can I mention that it makes me happy that this version of the Phantom can actually hold the Diamond Select version of the violin, even though it's so big, it looks more like a viola next to him. This is actually one of the things I meant to mention a little earlier, is looking back at my old Diamond Phantom review, I had said that the little hook on the music stand I have back here was clearly meant for what I called the cane, which is the breathing tube, because it couldn't hold the bow for the violin, when actually it holds the violin in the movie. You see it in the background with the violin hanging off of it. The Phantom doesn't actually play the violin in the movie, but I believe it was actually a scene that was intended to be in the film at one point, or maybe it was even filmed. I don't think it was based on what I read, but it was a scene where like the Phantom would go to the graveyard and play the violin while Christine was at her father's grave or something like that. So it does make me happy that I can actually have this version holding this violin in a somewhat believable fashion, holding that bow from the diamond version in a believable fashion, which I don't think that figure could even attempt to do, and kind of recreate a scene that never really happened in the movie. But yeah, I really love this release. I think this was a great thing. Honestly, my only real complaint with this figure is that paint rub that I got from the hat on the head, and it does seem like that is scratching off. I just don't want to do it while I'm trying to film stuff. I think it will come off. And be okay. I just don't want to risk scratching it too deeply right now while I'm trying to focus on other stuff. The Phantom is an iconic bit of Universal horror. Heck, I was just at Universal Studios earlier this week and went to go see their monster makeup effects show, which I've seen probably a good dozen times before, but you know, it's good to watch it again. And even still to this day, that has a section in it for Lon Chaney and his contribution to horror makeup effects with the makeup specifically that he did for this and for Hunchback. So a hundred years later, the man's work is still worthy of praise. And I think this figure is a great tribute to one of the earliest horror movie icons we have. So I would highly recommend this figure. As of now, I think I saw a post earlier today from NECA saying that they have nothing to announce yet as of a black and white version of this character. But honestly, I'm hoping for the other direction, personally. I am hoping for an announcement of the Mask of the Red Death version, the color scene from the original film, where we got to see the Phantom in his bright red skull mask costume. They did a tribute to it with their Casey Jones Phantom crossover figure, so I'm hoping that means it's firmly in their minds to give us that version of the character somewhere down the road. But we will see, I guess, Comic-Con's coming soon, right? So hopefully we'll get some updates on what's coming down the line for these figures. All I know is that Creature from the Black Lagoon is next, and I am highly anticipating that release, and then hoping to see at least some better shots of stuff they've already promised us, like another Lon Chaney version, London After Midnight, Nosferatu, that Bride version of the Frank Frankenstein monster, and hopefully some new stuff. Fingers crossed we get a nice Universal Monsters heavy SDCC reveal line, and it's not just a bunch of Ninja Turtles again. But yep, that's it for right now, and I'll see you guys next time. Later.